We are at lecture 57 today, so I think my earlier prediction of getting uh, close to 60 by the end of the class, I think we're actually going to be very, very close to that. Maybe we won't quite reach 60, but um, a couple things before we dive into um, the calculus. We have one section to cover, 8.9. Uh, the first part of it, I don't know that we'll deal with that in depth. Um, it's stuff we've already covered, really, in a lot of ways. It deals with error estimates and what are some different ways we can truncate this infinite series and have an idea about how bad our answer might be. Uh, so we can just kind of reiterate those. We won't do much with that. But there are a couple of applications to physics that I think are worth looking at. Uh, here's some information that I got yesterday, so it's pretty up to the date. Some unemployment information, so if you need a little extra motivation to stay in school and get your degree. Uh, this was for March 2009. Uh, if you have less than a high school diploma, so not you but anybody else that's watching, 15.5% um, of those people were unemployed in March of this year. Uh, if you are a high school graduate with no college, I guess that applies to one person in here. Um, I guess he had some college. I guess he had a couple days there. Um, those people in March, 10% uh, of those people are unemployed. So high school graduate, no college, a little bit better. Some college or an associate degree in March, 7.8% of those people were unemployed. And a bachelor's degree or higher, 4.3% of those people were unemployed. So what, what's the message of this data? Stay in school and get a degree is what it says to me, especially in this day and time where unemployment is kind of overinflated, overexaggerated. Uh, I think a meaningful college degree is very valuable. At least that statistically that plays out. Um, another thing before I had this written down yesterday and I um, just didn't address it. This is probably the, I guess, my curse of mathematics that uh, the, I, I like it so much. And uh, so I was uh, fixing a couch a love seat for my niece, who's a student at Carolina. Uh, even though she's over there, we still kind of like her. Um, so one of the springs on the love seat was malfunctioning, so I'm taking it all apart underneath and trying to figure out. So I go online to figure out kind of how this clip looked before it broke, because I just had a piece of it. So. Um, then it gives me all the specs of this clip, and it's got all this N minus 1 and D and K, and I should have brought that in. But, you know, it, I can't get away from it. So I'm trying to fix a couch, and here's all this numerical jumbo, you know, just tell me where I can buy the clip and tell me how to install it. You know, I can feel, I feel like I can fix it. So then to cap the weekend off, the uh, New York Yankees opened their new Yankee Stadium, one billion dollar stadium, so a thousand million dollar stadium. So that's just outrageous for a sports ar ar um, arena. So they had a little trouble with the Cleveland Indians, and one of their are anybody a Yankee fan? Do we have a Yankee fan in here? They had a little trouble, didn't they, with the Cleveland Indians? Um, so they did get it corrected, but one of their games, it was. 22 to 4, they got beat uh, in this, you know, billion dollar stadium. So the, I think it was the New York Post, the next day, had a, a headline, and the headline was 22 to 4, and then they put an exclamation mark. So where does my mind go? Uh, 22 to 4 factorial. Well, if this was four factorial, the Yankees would have actually won the game, right? Because it would have been 22 to 24, so they probably shouldn't have put that in the New York Post on the headline. So it wasn't 22 to 4 factorial, it was 22 to 4. The other thing that is related, um, 
<laughs> so that's, you know, it's just the curse, I guess, that you see this stuff and it's, oh, it's not four, you know, with an exclamation mark, it's four factorial. One of the problems on the test, and I know you don't all have it back yet, but uh, it's a problem, hopefully, that you remember is this one. Uh, that's the hyperbolic cosine. So you've probably, probably seen that key on your calculator. Kosh, it's sometimes referred to, the uh, Kosh function. It is not a trigonometric function. Pretty clearly, it's an exponential function. But as some of you noted on your test, those that I've graded thus far, is that it, when you're done with the series, the power series for it, it actually resembles, in a lot of ways, the power series for a cosine, a regular trigonometric cosine function. Um, some things that happen in this, derivative of e to the x is itself, and that's going to be all the way down the page. Derivative of e to the negative x is itself with a negative 1 tacked on. So the first derivative is this, and then when we get to second derivative, what happens? It goes back to the original function, right? So the derivative of e to the x is itself. Derivative of negative 1 e to the negative x is back to positive. And this pattern continues. When you evaluate this at 0, the function at 0, e to the 0 plus e to the negative 0, that's 1. There's another 1. So there's 2 in the parentheses times 1 half. Unfortunately, or I guess kind of fortunately in a way, we don't have to mess with the term at all because when you put 0 into the first derivative, e to the 0 minus e to the negative 0, you get a 0 here. So you alternate zeros and 1s. So as we saw in the cosine, um, this happens as well, is you lose every other term. So what does the function that we're calling hyperbolic cosine, what does the power series look like? There's the, when n equals 0, the original function at 0 is 1, x to the 0 over 0 factorial. So 1, right? Is that an even, like the cosine, is that an even expression? x to the 0, 0 factorial, 0 is even. So the next term we lose, because it's got a coefficient of 0, so we lose the what? linear term, the first degree term. So we pick up again with the second degree term. And what is that? It's also positive. That's where it's different, right, from the cosine. The cosine, the regular trigonometric cosine function, alternates signs. So does the sine, by the way. That, that was a kind of a common mistake on the one sine of x and then sine of the quantity x squared. And the integral of sine of the quantity of x squared problem is that a few of you, a handful of you, had that sine function as non-alternating. But sine and cosine are both alternating. This one is not. Uh, over 2 factorial, right? The next one we skip. Then we go to the fourth. So it happens to also be positive. And I think I ask you to carry it to 6, right? To n equals 6. So there's what it is. There are other terms to this, if it's actually going to be an equation. But we could truncate it by saying t6 is approximately the f of x. And what is t6?
Um, what do you think is the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine? Hyperbolic sine. There you go. Hyperbolic sine. Well, if the derivative of hyperbolic cosine is the hyperbolic sine, what then is the hyperbolic sine? Isn't it this? Right? So not only are they the derivative of one another, very convenient that they don't have some SIGN change involved. <laughs> they are the derivative of one another. They are the integral of one another. So you don't have to deal with this negative sign like we do with regular trig. Uh, th this function right here is the hyperbolic sign. And this function up here is the hyperbolic cosine. They are, in fact, the derivative of one another. What do you think the hyperbolic sign is going to look like? It's going to be the, if this is the even function part of it, it's going to be the odd function part, right? Because the um, constant's going to be gone. The linear term's going to be there. And again, we could truncate that, but that's what the hyperbolic sign. Now, hyperbolic, any guesses as to why that's part of this? What, a, what is regular trig, what's true about that? That one's that, sort of exponential. Well, they're both really exponential. <coughs> they're the ones like stays within the range of like one one. Is this related to something geometrically? And this is related to something else geometrically? Well, the H hyperbolic is because it's related to a hyperbola. The same way that the sine of x and cosine of x are related to a unit circle, right? If this is the angle theta, what are the coordinates of this point on the unit circle? So we call this circular trig a lot, but that's kind of the regular sine and cosine. What's the x value of this point on a unit circle having rotated through theta degrees or radians? Cosine theta. Y value is sine theta. So the way that regular trig is related to a unit circle, this kind of trig, hyperbolic trig, is related to points on a, guess what, hyperbola. And actually, technically, it'd be called a unit hyperbola. So it has to do with coordinates of points on a hyperbola, just the way regular trig deals with coordinates of points on a unit circle. Um, somebody graph. a hyperbolic cosine. And then we'll also try to get a picture. Um, maybe it'll graph Kosh. I don't know if you can actually put that into your calculator and it would graph that, but I know it'll graph this. What's it look like? you had to describe what it looked like, what other figure does it kind of resemble? It kind of looks parabolic, doesn't it? And it, can you tell what point this is right here? It's one, I think. Yes, it's got to be one. So it is not a parabola, but it kind of looks parabolic, 
That's what a hyperbolic cosine looks like if you were to plot points on this thing. Hyperbolic sine, this is sometimes called a cinch, okay, or hyperbolic sine. It kind of gets old saying hyperbolic sine over and over. What does it look like? At zero, you get zero, right? Because this is zero. Kind of looks a little bit like an x cubed function. So I think it looks something like, like this. That's what this guy looks like. So they are kind of nice, smooth, continuous curves. Um, can be dealt with a lot of times the same way that we study first, second derivative, integrate them. We just, in this book, it just isn't addressed very often, these two functions, hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. But I'm sure you've seen that key on your calculator. If you have a scientific calculator that has a cosine button, a lot of times the second function is the hyperbolic cosine. Uh, same thing with sine and hyperbolic sine. But that's what those two graphs look like. One thing that you've probably seen a picture of or maybe have actually seen in person uh, is the arch in St. Louis. It doesn't look like this. That'd be kind of a funny looking arch. But it looks like that flipped. So the symmetric image of this is actually, if you look at, and this again is the kind of the curse of mathematics, if you get a brochure for the arch of St. Louis, on the back of it, it actually gives you the equation for the arch of St. Louis. And it actually is not parabolic. It is it is a hyperbolic cosine, is the main function of that particular arch. So you may come across that in an engineering class uh, as far as something structurally probably pretty sound, I would imagine, is not this, but the symmetric image of that. So unfortunately, that's not addressed a whole lot in, in our book. All right, now let's go into section 8.9. The first part of section 8.9 talks about error estimates. Uh, let's just kind of briefly mention what it is they address, and I think we have addressed them somewhat sufficiently. Um, so they're talking about error estimates associated with Taylor polynomials, which kind of includes Maclaurin as well. By the way, if we say polynomial, that means we're truncating the series. We're not going to have all the terms all the way out to infinity, that we only want the first five or six or seven of those. Um, how do we estimate the error? And by the way, this also includes binomial series, because binomial series are rooted in Taylor expansion, so they are also included in this category. One that's not we haven't really addressed very much because we don't require in this class a graphing calculator. My guess is that most of you have one and use it. One of the ways that you can deal with error estimates is to actually graph the series itself and graph the truncated series, the Taylor polynomial or the binomial series polynomial. And for certain values, you can kind of compare and contrast the actual series with the truncated version. So you could do that on a graphing calculator. Other ways that we have, and we have done this, if you have an alternating series, that when I see that, I see a series, it's a Taylor series and it's an alternating series. One of the first things I think about is that <coughs> if I need to approximate, I know my upper bound for my error can be basically determined by the value of the next term, right? So we've dealt with errors on alternating series. You just, wherever you stop it, you look at the next term, and that's an upper bound for the error. So we've addressed that. I don't think we need to address it again. Taylor's inequality is where we looked at that capital M We had an M here. We had the N uh, plus first power of X 
or x minus a, depending on the function, over n plus 1. So it kind of is the next term with one slight adaptation, and we are going to include this in the problem we're going to go through today, uh, if in fact we get that far. m is the maximum value of the n plus first derivative on the function somewhere in the interval between x and a. Now, I don't know that a is less than x or greater than, than x, but I'll just write it like that. We can choose a value anywhere we want between x and a, or in fact, x or a. It's an upper bound for the error anyway, so we want to know what the error is at its worst. So we are going to use this in the problem we're going to look at today, and the numbers are hideous, I'll warn you, because we're going to be dealing with the speed of light. Uh, but that value actually ends up being in the denominator, which kind of helps the cause and makes it uh, our error a whole lot less than you might expect it to be. All right, I don't remember if this is the first example in the book, but it's probably one that you'll recognize, so that's why I think it's good for us to look at this one. I have another one from the list of problems ready uh, that we probably won't get to today, but we can get to that tomorrow. It's probably not as familiar, but we can still look at the equation that's handed to us, manipulate it in the same way we're going to manipulate this one that is kind of familiar to us. And we don't have to be experts about what we're manipulating to get it in the form of that we want it or to talk about the error associated with that. So this has to do with physics and a branch of physics that deals with the theory of special relativity. And here's the first equation, which may not look all that familiar to you. It kind of depends on who in here is a physics major or has used this in another math or math-related class uh, as an example illustrating some physics. So the mass of an object that's in motion, that's what m is, is related to the mass of the object at rest. So m sub zero is the mass of the object at rest in this fashion. V is the velocity of this object that's moving. And C is the speed of light. How many of you have used this equation in other courses before? Is that a common equation? Uh, we're going to work with this, and you, maybe you can see how we can manipulate this a little bit because we've got something that is in the form of, kind of, we have to adapt it a little bit, 1 plus, I know that's not plus, but we can make it a plus, x to a power. So we're kind of headed in this direction with parts of this problem not only in the development of the equation, but also uh, in the error estimate. We're going to use this guy right here. So m is the mass of the object that's in motion. m sub 0 is the mass of the object at rest. v is the velocity of the object. c is the speed of light. All right, we're going to use this equation to simplify, although it makes it look more complicated initially for a kinetic energy equation. So somebody tell me what that equation says, since we have some physicists in here that have had this stuff before. Kinetic energy, what, what is this? That's kind of the total energy. And what would this be? the energy of the object at rest, okay? So here's what's going to initially make it look more complicated, but then we'll manipulate it a little bit and hopefully make it look a little simpler. So here's what m is equal to.
we're going to put that in there for M and replace it and see what happens. So that's M. We're going to multiply that by C squared. So it looks worse temporarily. Uh, do you see any possible gains having made that substitution? What do they both have now? M sub zero C squared. So that could be factored out front. Let's bring that up from the denominator. That's all that's left, right, in the first term. So we have a 1 minus v squared over c squared to what power? To the negative 1 half. And then when we factor out m sub 0 c squared out of this one, what's left? 1. So let's take this thing in the binomial series expansion that we have done. That is the same thing as 1 plus negative v squared over c squared to the negative a half. What we have dealt with kind of generically is 1 plus x to the k. Well, our x value that we normally occupy this position with is now going to be negative v squared over c squared. And our k value is negative 1 half. So let's take a little bit of time and energy to expand this thing. We know we're not going to be able to find all terms, but we want to keep a few of them around to show that this is in fact something that you have probably used before, whether you're a physics student or not, you've probably come across this final result that we're going to come up with. All right, so this little piece of it, let's expand it and then we'll throw it back in this position. So 1 plus x to the k, what's the first term of that binomial series expansion? 1. That's going to kind of help the cause because it's going to get knocked out by this other 1 at the end. All right, what's the next term? Typically it would be what? k times x. For us, that's going to be Everybody agree? That's k times x. What's the next term? k times k minus 1. What would that be, Jacob? Negative 1 half times negative 3 halves over Two factorial. X, well, we don't have X. We have something that's being replaced for X. I don't like the way that's headed here. I'm running out of room. So our X value is negative V squared over C squared and we want that squared. Is that right? So there's k, k minus 1 over 2 factorial x. Well, we don't have x. We have negative e squared over c squared, that quantity squared. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in here. Negative a half, negative 3 halves, negative 5 halves over 3 factorial negative v squared over c squared cubed. Does that work? So we're going to put those things in 
right here. And let's see if we can simplify some of them as we go. So we're going to replace 1 minus v squared over c squared to the negative 1 half with this binomial series expansion. So we get a what? 1 half v squared over c squared, is that correct? How about the next term? Well, we've got a negative times a negative. And then we've got a negative v squared over c squared squared. So is it positive again? I think it's positive again. And we've got a 3 over 2, 4, 8. Does that look right? 3 eighths? So we've got negative v squared over c squared, that quantity squared. So v to the fourth over c to the fourth. And the last one, let's see. We've got three negatives, which is negative, and a negative cubed, which is also negative. So it looks like the end result is again going to be positive. In the numerator, we've got 15. Actually, let's knock the three out numerator and denominator. So in the numerator, we've got five. In the denominator, two, four, eight, 16. So there are more terms. Those are the ones that we found. And, and you'll see we're not going to need any more than that. It's probably well more than what we need. This one? Yeah. No. Should be positive. Uh, here's what I'm looking at. Negative, negative, negative. So their product is negative. And then we've got this negative thing that's cubed, which is also negative. So the end result should be positive. Okay. Uh, this is part of, and with the three dots, it's actually technically all of. 1 minus v squared over c squared to the negative 1 half. What are we going to do with that? We just did that. Now we're going to subtract 1 from that. There's a 1. There's a 1. So that's gone. Jacob. I still don't get the negative set up. Are, are, are you supposed to subtract them? Because then why isn't the second term negative? The second term, if I've written this down right, this was k was negative a half. And this is the x value. And it's the x value to the first. So it was negative. So there's a negative and there's a negative, which should be positive. OK, so all the terms are going to be positive? I, well, it looks that way based on what we see thus far. The next one's going to have four negatives. And it's going to be the negative to the fourth. So it appears that all the terms are going to be positive. Some of those terms way out to the right, <clears throat> we're not going to care much about anyway uh, for certain values of v compared to what we know how large c is. c is the speed of light. So we've got a whole bunch of terms. We're not going to look at very many of them. And in fact, we're going to stop right here. Not class. I mean, some of you are looking at your watch. Oh, yeah, that's, that sounds good. I like that. That's what I was waiting for. Not quite there yet. Um, if v is small, compared to c, c is the speed of light, which is a large number. So for small values of v, if even though this is v to the fourth, which takes this small value of v and raises it to the fourth, isn't it going to be completely outweighed by c, which is way larger than v, 
this C value to the fourth. And it's going to only get worse as we go out to the right. So if V is small compared to C, C is not small, then these terms, in a sense, become somewhat meaningless. Well, if we ignore these terms, realizing that it's truncated now, we are going to have some error, and that's part of what we'll do. I don't know if we'll get to that today. I don't know if I should use equal. Let me put equal with a dot above it. So if we stop it, truncate the series, there we end up with this. And for small values of V, this is going to be very, very close to the full-blown kinetic energy equation. By the way, what could we reduce here? C squared over itself. Does that look familiar? So that's not exactly kinetic energy, but isn't that the one that's probably used more often than not? Uh, I think this was actually kind of discovered or uh, published first by Newton. But that's probably what you've used for kinetic energy more so than the first formula that we started with. So it isn't exactly, but it's very, very close especially for small values of V, and they don't have to be all that small. That's why I put small in quotation marks. A lot of things are small compared to the speed of light. So for small values of V, this is what that formula for kinetic energy actually is. So it's the result of a binomial series expansion. Now, let's take a look at the beginning of the error term. I don't know if we'll finish this. But um, we haven't really used this a lot. This Taylor's inequality, which deals with the error. So we want the error associated with the first Taylor, because we chose the n equals 0 term. We used it. That was the 1. We went on to the next one, n equals 1, and we kept that one but then we got rid of all the rest of them. So this is the error associated with the first Taylor. I know we didn't use Taylor. We used the binomial series, but that is the result of the Taylor um, series. <coughs> so the upper bound for the error associated with uh, the first Taylor polynomial would be this m value that we addressed earlier. Because don't we go to the n plus first term? So if this is 1, we want to go to the n plus 1 value, the value of 2 for that. So m is the maximum value of the second derivative. Second derivative of what? Well, we've got this function, which is kind of an ugly function with v squared and c squared in it. Let's simplify it a little bit to this. Probably would have been helpful if I would write that down, which it doesn't appear that I actually wrote it down. So I am putting an x in there just to make the derivative process go a little bit better. Chandler, make sure you tell him I said hello. Um, I want to go ahead and give my salutations there, too. So this in the formula is what? Negative v squared over c squared, right?
go ahead and find the derivative. This stuff is coefficients, right? What's the derivative of this thing? Wouldn't it be negative 1 half 1 plus x to the negative 3 halves times the derivative of what's inside, which is 1, and then the derivative of minus 1, which is 0. So there's the first derivative. We need the second derivative. So all this is lead coefficients. We bring that all along. Now we need the derivative of 1 plus x to the negative 3 halves, which would be negative 3 halves, 1 plus x to the negative 5 halves, times the derivative of what's inside, which is 1. So there's our second derivative. So what do we have? We have two negatives, which is positive. Uh, we have 3 over 4. M0, we have a C squared. And we have a 1 plus x to the negative 5 halves, which I'll just put that down in the denominator where it belongs. So we want to maximize the value of the second derivative. Uh, m sub 0, we're not going to know that, so that's going to remain in the problem. Everything else we should be able to sub in. Uh, C is 3 times 10 to the 8th. meters per second. Does that look right for C? Okay. I haven't used that value in a while. And we're also handed in this particular problem, we want to know the error associated with values of V that are small, and they give us a relatively small value of V. So this is given to us as 100. So we want to know how far off this value is at its worst What's the upper bound for the error when we have a small velocity, 100, compared to the speed of light, which is a whole lot larger than that? And again, we don't care if the error is positive or negative. We just want to know how far off we might be at the worst. Um, back in the what they call the Taylor's inequality. We stopped, we put in n equals 0, and we put in n equals 1. So we really used the first Taylor polynomial. Here's the error associated with the first Taylor. So it's called r sub 1 because it's associated with t1. This was the value 1, and this was the value, what did we get there? Uh, 1 half v squared over c squared, right? And we kind of drew the little squiggly line. We didn't take any of the rest of them. So that's why we use t1, so we want r1. We want to go to the next value, to the n plus first power of x, and the n plus first factorial, and then this is the maximum value of the n plus first derivative. So that's why we're dealing with the second derivative, because we stopped with t1. So there's the C value. We can plug that in. We do know the um, X value, and I called it X to make the derivative process simpler. What was X temporarily representing? Negative V squared over C squared. Actually, Squared. Or no. Oh, wait, no, second. Okay. No, never mind. We okay? Yeah, we're good. Wait, no, it should be squared, yeah. Yes, C squared, thank you. 
because we, we're just basically filling in what we know. We don't know m sub 0, so we're just carrying that through. 3 m sub 0, this is the c value squared. Correct that. Thank you. And down here we want a 4, and our 1 plus x becomes 1 minus v squared over c squared. that to the 5 halves. Now that's just the m part of this. That's kind of the maximum value of the second derivative on this interval. Let's go all the way back to the error and I, this is prob we're probably going to be able to set this up and then we'll have to kind of finish the problem. So here's our error. We need all of this. So we need the m value. We have that. <coughs> so that's m. We need x squared. So what was x? x was negative v squared over c squared. We want that squared, kind of numerically kind of intensive here. We can push the buttons later. It may take us from the end of class today to the beginning of class tomorrow to actually push all these buttons so we can get an error. And all that is over, what, 2 factorial? So we should have an answer that is not completely numerical because it's got a mass of the object at rest in it, which we don't know. But in terms of that number, whatever it is, if you have a few minutes to push these buttons in this order, you'll, you'll realize that those terms that we truncated are virtually meaningless to the, to the solution to this problem with a relatively small v value compared to a pretty large c value. Um, this should be, when all is said and done, Somebody can check the arithmetic. But if we've got that level of accuracy, regardless of what that value is, that's pretty good. We've done really, really well with a velocity of 100 meters per second compared to the C value for the um, speed of light. So there's the arithmetic that's supposed to get us that. Everybody agree that's a pretty good level of accuracy? I would take that. All right, we're out of time today. We will do probably one brief example. You might want to bring your old tests tomorrow, especially if there's something you want to ask specifically about a test question on one of the early tests. That probably we could handle that tomorrow. <coughs>